God. God is good. Amen. 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 Almighty is actually working. Praise the Lord. One, two. One, two. Is that one? Yeah. Receiver. One, two. No, it's not. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. God is good. I'm going to uh, minister this evening out of the book of Revelation. And uh, we've done these conferences a few times now. And, and honestly, every time I get down to pray about what the Lord wants me to share, just about always it's something that's just a little bit different than I normally would. And usually quite a bit different, to be honest with you, quite a bit out of my comfort zone. And a while back, I was driving, and I was listening to somebody, I don't know if it was on the radio or what now. But they, they, they mentioned a couple of things about the book of Revelation, about the, the church at Philadelphia. And as they were talking about that, boy, something just really jumped out at me. And, and the Lord just spoke to me then and said, you know, that, that's what you want to share at the conference next time. And uh, I began to, I kind of put it on hold, and then here a while back, a few days ago, I began to dig into it and look into it. And, and the Lord gave me a really specific message for tonight. And, and I'm going to do my best to be real disciplined and stick right to the point and bring it right down to one single point that I bring the Lord that wants to share with us tonight. And, uh, but to get started, I want us to think about basketball. And, uh, because tonight's theme in the teaching is going to be stay the course and trust the process. And I'm going to show something out of the book of Revelation and tie it together with the book of Acts that I think is very, very informational for us in the day and the hour we live. But before we do that, I want you to think about basketball. And when I get to the end of the teaching, you're going to understand why. Stay the course and trust the process. Stay the course and trust the process. I believe it's a prophetic word for God. Stay the course and trust the process. Now imagine that you have somebody who's a basketball player, and they go out and they're in the NBA, say, we'll put them in the NBA, and they have practiced since they were about six or seven years old how to do free throws. And they've been doing free throws all of these years, probably, oh, 500, 600 a day, maybe 1,000 a day, doing this all the time. And they've been taught all those years how to do free throws. They've worked at the mechanics of free throws, and they worked on their release and all of that stuff. And, and they've got it down to where, you know, there's guys in the NBA who make free throws probably 90% of the time. And they've run their sprints back and forth, back and forth on the basketball court so they can simulate shooting free throws when they're tired. They've stood and had their friends yell and scream at them so they simulate all of that stuff. And then they hit a stretch of time where they go out and they shoot free throws, and they start missing all the time. Now, the main thing that you have to tell them is to what? Just keep doing what you've always done. You don't try to change anything. You've been doing it the same way now for, for 30 years, for 40 years, however long it may be. You've always done the same mechanics. You've always done the same practice. You've always done the same workouts. It's always worked for you, so stay the course. Stay the course. Trust the process. Trust the training you've had. Trust the years of practice you've had. Trust what's behind you. Trust the results you've had in the past. And keep doing what you've always done. Stay the course and trust the process. You know, I used to coach sports some. And, and what, the worst thing that can happen in, in teaching youth how to do a sport is to have them do something wrong and have it work. I mean, that is a nightmare. They go out and, and, and you know, do everything wrong and have it work out for them and get good results. Why? Because it's hard to get them to come off of it then. And they realize that, yeah, what you're doing is the wrong way, and eventually it's, you're going to pay the price if you don't learn how to do it right. And as I was listening that day to the teaching on the radio, it just really hit me. Boy, that really applies to the church at Philadelphia. <coughs> Stay the course. Stay the course and trust the process. And let me share with you what I mean by that. The book of Revelation, chapter 3. And go to verse number 7. The book of Revelation, chapter 3, and verse number 7. Is the church of Philadelphia, and to kind of give it a little bit of background here, there's seven churches mentioned in the book of Revelation, here at the beginning of the book of Revelation. The church of Philadelphia is the one that is considered the church that's right. I mean, this is the church that God really commands. This is the church that God nowhere at any point in time gives it any criticism. But God compliments the church at Philadelphia and, and, and for three key things, three very important things. And because of three, three key things, he says they have an open door that no man can shut. And so I mean, 
began to look at it, Lord, we ought to know what those three things are. Because we want an open door, don't we? I don't care what it is, what we're doing in life, whether it's a church, whether it's a ministry, whatever our walk is, we want an open door put there by God, don't we? And so when we look at what the reason this door was open for the church of Philadelphia, it tells us a whole lot about an open door. And uh, I just began to look at that and I thought, Lord, that just really lit me up about the open door and why Philadelphia had an open door. And when I began to dig into the Word a little bit, I thought, Lord, there is such a pattern there. And all we got to do is stay the course and trust the process and we can walk under an open door. Uh, Revelation chapter 3, and I'm not going to just dwell on this a whole lot, but let's begin reading at verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works, behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make of them a synagogue of state which say they are the Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thee, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly, hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven. From my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now one of the first questions people always ask about this is, is you know, how does that apply to us? You know, how does reading about some church, <laughs> the church of Philadelphia, in the book of Revelation, that had a letter sent to it, how in the world does that apply to us? I mean, here we are, we're, we're a couple thousand years removed from them, and, and, and you know, across the world from them. What in the world could that have to, have, possibly have to do with any churches here in central Illinois? But we find out that these, these verses and this, this church has an application far above and beyond that, I believe. I mean, there's three really key applications in this passage. One is it does apply to the church at Philadelphia. There was a church that was historically there at that time, and that was a message to them. But I also believe it applies to a prophetic church. Yes. And I also believe it applies to a future church. You know, there's a lot of people who believe that these seven churches kind of represent seven ages or seven seasons and, and are, are prophetic of these things. And I personally think that this church and this verse is the main reason that I think there's a lot of uh, credence to that. And, and if you look at verse number 10, that's where we're going to spring away at. Uh, verse number 10, blessed because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all to try them that dwell upon the earth. So he's speaking to this church in Philadelphia, which is a historical church at that time, but he's also telling them he's going to keep them from an hour of temptation that's going to come upon all the earth. Now, I don't know about you, but when I look into the Word of God, I can only find one time that there's a temptation or a trial that goes across all the earth. And that would be the time of what we refer to as the Great Tribulation. There's a time that the Bible tells us in the, in the book of Daniel that there's a tribulation that coming upon this world like no nation has ever seen before. There's a time, according to the book of Revelation, when we're going to see a, a time when, when the greatest political monster that's ever been upon this earth is going to rise the power of the Antichrist. There's a time when, when it says that the enemy is going to be cast down and, and, and he's going to have great wrath upon this earth because he knows his time's short. I always call that Satan in a panic. I mean, he's going to be in a panic, you know. You, you always hear about getting those little nervous dogs trapped in the corner. They go crazy and all that. Well, that's where Satan's going to be. He's going to be that little crazy dog trapped in the corner. And he's just going to unleash everything. And it's also a time upon the earth when the kings and the rulers and, and the rich men are all crying out for the rocks to even fall upon them because it's the great day of God's wrath. So there's a time that's coming upon this planet when we're going to see just total havoc. I mean, we think it's rough now, but I mean, can you imagine a time, and I was just sitting today and just kind of praying on this and just kind of trying to visualize what that must be like. I mean, a time when just all havoc breaks loose like never before. A time when the Antichrist is unleashed. A time when Satan is going to hog wild. And a time when the wrath of God is being poured out upon this planet. 
And so that's the only time that I know of prophetically in the Word of God when there is a temptation or a trial that comes upon the whole earth. So if that's speaking about that, and he's speaking to the church of Philadelphia, then the church of Philadelphia has to be a prophetic church. Because that has to be referring to something in the future. And there was nothing historically that happened at that time. There was nothing historically that I'm aware of that took place at that time that it could have been that he kept the Philadelphia church from. There's a tremendous tribulation. And it's not, it's not unusual, beloved, for God to take something and, and, and give it a couple applications like that. It's not unusual for that to take place. I mean, beloved, we can look back at the word of God. And you remember the time when Moses was in the wilderness and he went and tapped the stone with the rod and the water came out of it? And we know all about that. And, and we find out later on in the book of Corinthians, it tells us that that stone was Jesus. And so that was representative of Christ being crucified, Christ being smitten on the cross, and the Spirit of God being poured out from that work of Jesus Christ. That's representative of that. So that was a real event that took place. Moses really tapped the rock. Water really came out of that rock, but it also was pointing forward to something that was prophetic about to happen. We know the time that in the, in the wilderness with Moses again, when, when they were spent, when they were bitten by the serpents, and, and Moses cried out to God and told him to, to take the, the, the staff and to put the serpent on the end of it and hold it up. And everyone who looked at that would be healed. And they all looked at it and they were healed. And then later on in John chapter 3, we know that Jesus brought it to our attention that that was him upon that, that, upon that, that stem. And he was held up like that. And that serpent was actually him upon the cross. So again, that was something that happened historically. That was a real historical event, but it also pointed forward to something that was going to happen prophetically, didn't it? Christ was going to be held up. Christ was going to be placed upon the cross. And Christ was our healer. The same way as that, he was that rock that was spit and the waters came forth. Christ is our baptizer. And so it's not unusual at all for the word of God to do that and to take things and apply them to not only one historical event, but also prophetically to a future event. Um, and it says that it's going to keep them from the hour of temptation. It's going to keep them from the hour of temptation. It's going to keep them from the hour of temptation. See, this implies all kinds of stuff, doesn't it? It says there's going to be a church, there's going to be a body of people, and at a time when there's a worldwide trial, at a time when there's a worldwide temptation, Jesus is promising he's going to keep them from it. That sounds like good news to me. Amen. Because it tells me something there. That's, again, one of the scriptures that I think gets established as a pre-trip rapture like nothing else. Because it says it's going to keep them from that hour of temptation. It's going to keep them from that hour of trial. That sounds to me like what the Bible talks about in 1 Thessalonians, when it talks about Jesus coming back in the clouds and giving that trumpet sound and, the, and us rising up and forever to be with him. It sounds to me like that's talking about something, a prophetic church here, a church that is going to be kept or raptured out of the tribulation before the tribulation and that time of trial. So I believe that this is exactly what we see here, that God, God is speaking to this church in Philadelphia, but he's also speaking to us prophetically. He's also speaking to a future time, at a time when the tribulation is going to come across this earth, and he's going to keep them from it. Again, we need to learn about the church of Philadelphia, because this is a church with an open door, and this is a church that's going to be kept from that trial and temptation. We need to know all about them, don't we? We need to understand this church in Philadelphia. There's a lot of reasons there. So it not only applies historically to that church, but I believe it's obvious from that verse in that scripture that it applies prophetically to, to a, a church in the last days. Now it also has another application. You might say, well, pastor, I don't know. I mean, I obviously went in that church historically, and I obviously, I don't know that I'm in that church. It's going to be that last day church. I mean, you talk about the rapture. Doesn't the Bible say the rapture could happen any time? It could happen tonight, or it could happen a hundred years from now, and I could be dead and gone. Absolutely. Absolutely. But there's also another word that says this applies possibly to you tonight. Now, there are those who could sit here tonight and it could not apply to you. Whether or not it applies to us by this verse is dependent upon our choice and our decision. Because let me show you another verse. Look at verse number 13. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So if you have an ear to hear tonight, then this applies to you. You see, that's a choice we make. 
You know, one of the things people hear all the time that, that listen to me, and, and you hear a phrase come out of my mouth a lot, spiritual darkness is a choice. Spiritual darkness is a decision we make. And whether or not we hear God is a decision we make. I mean, one of the, the passages that I, I talk about a lot is, is in Matthew chapter 13, and it, it talks about the parable of the sword, when Jesus taught the parable of the sword, and the disciples went to him and said, you know, why, why, do, you, why do you speak to them in parables? But Jesus said an awesome thing. He says, it's to you, it's given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. Well, I think that's good news, and I'm glad it's, I have the right to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. As a believer, we have a right to go and visit the kid God. He said, but unto them, I speak unto parables. They, they see and they, they don't see and they hear and they don't hear. Well, it sounds to me like God set them up. But he goes on right after that and says, for they have closed their eyes. They have closed their eyes. They, they don't see because they've closed their eyes. They don't hear because they've closed their ears. You see, beloved, spiritual darkness is a choice to be made. I mean, there's all kinds of people that could be here tonight. They could have chosen to come here tonight and, and, and hear teaching from God's Word. They could have chosen to be here Thursday night and, and Wednesday night and, 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 and Friday night. They could have chosen to be here tomorrow. Or they could choose not to be. They could choose to stay home and watch TV and, 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 and sit in spiritual darkness. <clears throat> We have all kinds of Bibles. Do you realize we have the greatest opportunity to know God's Word of any people who's ever walked on this planet? Yeah, yeah. I mean, do you realize what we have in our access? Yeah. I mean, my goodness, I have probably more stuff in my access to study than any preacher ever has in any generation before me. Do you realize the stuff I can access on the Internet? Mm -hmm. I mean, what I can access on the Internet when I'm studying the Word of God, I would have had to have the largest <laughs> library and imagination to, to, to contain the books. You see, beloved, we have access to all kinds of stuff. I have gone on the internet and, and, and listened to, to, to preachers online that, that have been dead for 30, 40, 50 years. I can find up materials that were written and they're just archived in some museum somewhere. There's no limit, hardly, to what I have access to or you have access to. We have all the Bibles and the study Bibles and, you know, there's these guys in Africa and we sent them some materials and, and we sent them a, a couple of study Bibles and some study materials and reference books and they think that's the greatest thing in the world because they don't have that. But you and I have access to the things of God like no people who have ever lived on this planet. We have an open door. <coughs> we have an open door. You see, but it's all a matter of, of the attitude we have. And, 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 you know, I always go back to Proverbs chapter 4. And it tells us to attend to his words. It tells us to incline to his words. You know, the Bible tells us to seek out God's wisdom like we do silver and treasure. You see, beloved, if we're sitting here and we think, you know what, I'm going to hear from God tonight. And we're tuned in with our spirit, and we're listening to hear the voice of God, and we're not just coming in here to go through some kind of church service and just sing a few songs and lift our hands and say hallelujah once in a while and listen to the preacher preach for a minute and say, yeah, good, good sermon, good sermon. But we're truly here with our hearts wide open and our ears wide open and thinking, God, I want to hear from you tonight. I need to hear your voice. I need some revelation from you tonight, God. Then we're going to hear something from God, and this passage applies to us. But if you're not in and you're just here going through some kind of religious motion, and it probably doesn't. Mm -hmm. We choose tonight whether or not this passage applies to us because it says that he hath an ear that it applies to us. Yes. But if you're not here to hear from God, then it doesn't apply. You know, you can just go through the motions. Mm -hmm. There are people who do that all their life. Yes. They go and they sit in churches and they sing the psalms and and. and, and Say amen to the servants and go home and never receive anything from God because they're really not there. They're just going to the motions. Then that, that passage don't apply to them. <clears throat> if you're hungry tonight, this applies to you. If you have a desire to, to know the word of God, this applies to you. But notice now, let's go back to verse 7. And I'm going to bounce you around here in Philadelphia a little bit. And I'm going to kind of stick right to the point, though, because I want to lead us right down to one final point that I believe the God would want us to go to tonight. Revelation 3, 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, 
write these things, saith he that is holy. He that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. God opens doors that no man can shut. God shuts doors that no man can open. Think on that for a moment. God opens doors that no man can shut. And God shuts doors that no man can open. Amen? Amen. Who shut the door on the ark? God did, didn't he? Probably nobody could open that door, could they? they probably, I don't know if anybody tried or not, but I, I know they were successful. God opens doors that no man can shut. And shuts doors that no man can open. Now I want us to dwell on this for just a second. Because again, that implies some really specific things. That implies some certain things for you and I to know. If success and fruitfulness is based upon God having opened the door, then failure and defeat would be based upon us trying to go through a door that God's closed. So what we need to know is where are the open doors? Where has God opened doors in my life? Where has God closed doors in my life? Where has God opened doors in a church? And where has God closed doors? How can I be sure that the door is open? You see, I believe that whether or not the door is open depends upon you and I. And I'm going to share with you tonight how I believe the door comes open. I say, well, praise God, let's open some doors. But the first thing we've got to understand, that implies that we have to be led by the Holy Spirit. Because if you remember right, remember in Paul's life, when Paul, you see, we can be doing something that sounds great, but truly not be an open door there. Paul was going to go to Asia and preach the gospel, wasn't he? And it says that the Holy Spirit forbid him from going there. Now, if you don't understand the rest of what took place, you would think, what in the world happened there? Why would God forbid Paul from going and preaching in Asia? Didn't he tell him to go to all the world and preach the gospel? But apparently that door wasn't open for him. And then right after that, he had a vision of a man in Macedonia saying, come unto us and help us. So apparently there was an open door there. And Paul responded and he followed them and he went to Macedonia and seen tremendous fruit. But see, beloved, he had to be led by the Holy Spirit to do that. He had to understand that how the way the Holy Spirit spoke to him, how it forbid him to go, it doesn't give us that understanding, but he had to be listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit to realize I don't go there. And he had to be listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit when he had that vision of the Macedonian man to go to Macedonia. So one of the first things we have to understand, one of the first key elements we have to know is this, if we're going to walk in open doors and not run into closed doors, we're going to have to be led by the Holy Spirit, aren't we? We're going to be walking in the Holy Spirit. You know, one of the examples of that that always used to baffle me, and, and sometimes I still scratch my head, when Philip went into Samaria and preached the gospel, I mean, for all intents and purposes, in Acts chapter 8, he was in tremendous revival. I mean, he was just, you know, seeing people were healed, people were being set free, people were being saved, they were being baptized in the Holy Spirit. I mean, this is every preacher's dream. And then God sent an angel and says, okay, I want you to leave and go witness to this guy. Okay, you're done here, Philip. Come on. And he sent him out for right in the middle of a revival and outpouring of God and led him to speak to one man. Now, apparently, he had to be led by the Spirit for that. Because why not? See, most of us would argue with God. <laughs> Wait a second, Lord. I can't be scary. Don't you see what's happening here? Lord, look how many people are saved. Look how many people are healed. Look at all these people that are being delivered. Look at the great joy that's going forth here. Look at all the tremendous things that are taking place here, God. I can't leave here. And he went to the Ethiopian who's in the chariot. He's reading Isaiah chapter 53. And, and, and the Spirit led him up to that man to witness to him. He said, do you understand what you're reading? He says, how can I? How can I? Unless somebody explains it to me. Phil explained it to him. Let him be Christ. Baptize him. And the Spirit led him away. Yeah. Now, we might go. There was an open door there, wasn't there? Now, we might say that don't make sense. We don't know what impact that Ethiopian man had. That's right, brother. We don't know how much of it. You know, he may have led multitudes to Christ. He may have went and planted a church that 
dead, then what? You know, still what he wants to do to Christ. We don't know, but the point is, is he had to be led by the Spirit of God to know where to go. Because quite honestly, that went contrary to human reasoning. That went contrary even to most godly people's thinking. Most people would say, if you brought that before a uh, church board or something, well, no, you stay right there in Samaria. Look at the results we're seeing. Look how fast the churches go out there. You want to go out here and witness to one God. But there was an open door, and, and, I, and I can feel pretty assured that, you know what? If Paul would have went to Asia and preached when the Holy Spirit forbid him, he probably wouldn't see many results, would he? If Philip would have stayed in Samaria, there wouldn't have been any results anymore. They would have been working with a closed door. Rather than following the Spirit into an open door. That implies something to you and I. That implies accountability. Because you think, well, praise God, Pastor, I want an open door. That's fine, but you're going to answer to God for what you do with it. You're going to be accountable for it. You see, that's one of the things that we, we sometimes in any form we know we don't like to talk about. We don't like to talk about accountability. But you know what, beloved? You remember what it said there? See, it's something we've got to understand here. It says that Jesus opened doors that no man can shut. And he shuts doors that no man can open. If you're walking in an open door, there's nothing man can do about it. You know, as I was thinking about that, 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 that scripture just jumped out of me. I thought, you know, we look at certain examples in the Bible that we've heard preached all of our life, and do we really look at it in this context? I mean, just think about it. Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? There was an open door there for them to worship God, God alone. There was an open door there for them to worship the one true God. And then Nebuchadnezzar says, you know what, I'm going to close that door. I'm no longer going to allow that door to be open. I'm no longer going to allow them to worship the one true God. So he says he's going to close that door, didn't he? So he built this big golden idol, and when the music sounded, everybody had to bow down and worship that golden idol. There's a lot of people today trying to close doors. They're trying to tell Christians that you can't worship this way, and you can't worship that way, and you can't do this, and you can't do that, and all these regulations they're trying to put upon Christianity, and you're not being tolerant if you don't worship 15,000 gods. They sounded the trumpets and they had right to shack and Bingo refused to bother that golden idol. So then he could never be the kind man. He was so I'll give you another chance. Turn the furnace up seven times. Now I'm going to give you a second opportunity to fall down and worship that idol. They did it again and they refused to do it, didn't they? And they cast him into a fire. Remember that God says he's going to open doors that no man can shut. No man can shut, Nebuchadnezzar can't shut that door from them being able to worship the one true God. And he looked into that fire and what happened? Oh, there's what looks like the Son of Man. And he came out and there was no burns, there was no smell, there was no damage done to them. Why? Because there was an open door that no man can shut. Amen. Nebuchadnezzar, you can't stop them from worshiping the one true God. I put an open door in their life and there ain't no man that can shut it. Daniel had an open door of prayer. To the one true God. And they tried to put political pressure on him to stop him from doing that. And they released, released a new law on the land. Nobody could call upon anybody or pray to anybody but the Almighty King. And what did Daniel do? He went and he prayed to the one true God. And so they had to enforce the law, and they had to, to, to cast him into the lion's den. And they cast him into the lion's den, and the angel came in and shut the lion's mouth. And apparently, again, something happened. Why? God said that door is open for him to pray. Ain't no man can shut it. God opens doors that no man can shut. God shuts doors that no man can open. Those open doors in your life, nobody can stop it. No man can shut it. We can stand on the word of God, and we can trust where there's an open door over the church, and we can trust where there's an open door in the body of Christ. There is no ruler, there's no nation, there's no political power that can shut that door. Beloved, we can stand on the word of God and fully trust our God to keep the door open if we're walking with him. He says he opens doors that no man can shut there's no president can shut it. What's the name over there in 
North Korea can't shut no doors. Yeah. You will like what they did to the Apostle John? They were trying to shut the door over there, man, weren't they? Let's just put him out in the middle of an island somewhere where he can't talk to nobody. And while he's out there, Jesus came out and talked to him. Well, that closed that door, didn't it? I mean, while he was there, by the way, heaven opened up and said, John, come here a minute. Wide open door above him in the heavens, and he went up and he received the book of Revelation. God says there's an open door, and no man can shut it. You can banish him on an island, but that door is going to be open. That door of Revelation in that man's life, no man can shut it. They could put Paul in a jail cell somewhere and lock him up, but that door was open. He sat there and wrote the Bible. No man can shut it. 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 Hallelujah! I don't know if you're excited, but I am. No man can shut that door, glory to God. Hallelujah! <laughs> then on the other side of the coin, God closes it, you can't open it. So we better find out how to please the door open. David? Yeah. You see, beloved, what we've got to understand here. We do have an open door for the gospel to <laughs> like this world's never seen right now. Right here. Amen? Amen. Amen? But we're going to be accountable for what we do with that open door. And I'm going to have a challenge for you tonight. You see, remember the ten talents? You know, it came five talents to one man. Two of his talents to one, one talent to the other, and come back and take a count. And the one who had five now had ten. The one who had been given two now had four. The one who had one ran away and hid it and buried it. See, one thing we find out in the Word of God, there is accountability in the kingdom of God. And whatever God gives to us, we have to give account for what we do with it. And beloved, we can shout and rejoice over the open doors that we have. But beloved, I think the church really needs to be challenged on what we're doing with it. I think we need to stop and look and say, wait a second. How do we lined up with this? How can we give account for that open door? You see, I don't believe the heart of the Father has changed one bit. I don't believe the heart of the Father has changed one bit. If you remember the, the, the great supper that was prepared... They, the man sent the, the, the servants out to, to get people to come in. Those who were invited, those who were invited, they had excuses. Well, wait a second. I just bought some land. I can't come. And I just bought a couple oxen and I just got married. I can't come. They all had excuses why they couldn't come. And so the heart of the Father becomes so obvious at that point in time. The heart of the Father at that point in time was like, wait a second. Go out into the highways and hedges. Bring in the halt and the lame and the babe and bring them in here. Go out there. Compel them to come into my house and my house might be full. The heart of the Father is found in Luke chapter 15 where the, he went out after the one lost sheep and he, he moved out of the furniture and swept the house to find the, the one lost coin and, and stood and watched for his prodigal son to come home. Beloved, the heart of the Father hasn't changed. The heart of the Father looks down today at our communities of perishing people and he says, Praise God. 
My church is different. Praise God. Is your city different?
You see, I understand on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out. The Apostle Peter said that's for all generations, didn't he? He said, well, we're in the last days. That applies that way. He said in Acts chapter 2 and 17, in the last days, he said, Lord, I pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Amen. So where does the little dunamis come in? And then the Lord began to talk to me. He says, Mike, what do you think about the church right now? Do they have a little dunamis or a mono dunamis? I was going to have to explain this to you. I said, uh, well, Lord, let's look at the Word. I mean, Acts chapter 2, God poured out the Holy Spirit, and 5,000 got saved. Mm -hmm. okay. That's pretty good. Acts chapter 4, they called out upon God, He poured out His Spirit, and shook the building. The power of God was there so much the building shook, and they went forth proclaiming the Word of God boldly. Are we proclaiming the Word boldly? Acts chapter 5, Peter's shadow, the anointing upon him, they bring all the multitudes to him, they were healed. Do we have little dunamis? Or a lot of dunamis? And then the Lord showed me something here, I think, to help me understand this. Say it. And how we go home when we have a service, maybe God really moves and Anointing strong, we see stuff manifest, and we go home and boom, boom, that was powerful. What do we say? Well, some people might say that was powerful, and others might say that was average. You see, when I determined by a service on how powerful it was, it's totally based upon my past experience, isn't it? Yes. I mean, it's based upon what I've experienced in my life. I mean, there was a time when I was in churches that didn't know anything about the power of the Holy Spirit, and I walked in some churches that did, and I was like, whoa. Change my world. Why? Because up at that time I had never experienced the Holy Spirit at all. Now I might come, you know, in, in, in the conference we've had some services. The Holy Spirit was powerful. Ooh, glory. Why? Because that's, that's stronger than I felt in the past. But I'm not right on this. God is saying this. So God, I believe, is saying they have a little dunamis because he's looking <laughs> what is really being manifest there. And he's looking at it in comparison to what is available to them. You see, if I could say, boy, is the Holy Spirit strong in services tonight? Oh, praise God, glory to God. God's looking at it and I'd say, my goodness, that's a drop of water. i got a notion, guys. I mean, there's so much more available. But how else could God describe it but a little dude of us? Because we have so much more available, he's telling them what they're seeing manifest. And because you got a little bit still going on, I'm going to give you an open door. You see, beloved, when we look at what happens when the Holy Spirit shows up, the gospel's preached. The gospel's preached. Don't stop its door. It's a little too us. The gospel's preached. It's the first thing that Jesus said because he was a Please, the gospel, the poor, the brokenhearted are healed. Captives are set free. Think about it. The covering of sight to the blind. Those who are totally crushed and annihilated are healed. Do we see that? Yes, we do. Do we see it a little or a lot? Because if we see it a little, then we got to do this. Compared to what God says available to us. See, from our point of view, it might look like a lot. But when you look from God's point of view at what is available to the church, it says, that's a little bit. You got, you got to drink water tonight. You guys, I wouldn't want the ocean. <laughs> you see, Acts chapter 4. I'm heading to a certain place, so we're getting there. Going to a spot of revelation. Acts chapter 4. There's three key things that you will find 
in the early church. It's recorded in the book of Acts. They were very significant of how the church operated. Acts chapter 4, 29 to 31, reveals it. This is not my thing. I, I read a teaching a lot years and years ago by T.L. Osborne that just really opened this up to me. The book of Acts is like. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto the servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. First thing, that was the word of God. By stretching forth thy hand to heal that signs and wonders by being named by the name of the holy child Jesus. The name of Jesus. Verse 31, and they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. You have the Word of God, you have the name of Jesus, and you have the Holy Spirit. You have the Word of God, you have the name of Jesus, and you have the Holy Spirit. We're going to go somewhere in just a second, but just to kind of let you whistle a little bit, if you'll notice what the Church of Philadelphia is told by, they have an open door, they have a little strength, they kept the word and not denied the name. Same three elements. The word of God, the name of Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. You will find all throughout the entire book of Acts with the early church function, they did three things. They preached the word, they exercised their authority in the name of Jesus, and they did it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Remember the free throws? Remember that? Stay in the course. Trust the process. If I find in the early church that God was having them function, and when they were functioning properly, and that they had been discipled by Jesus, they were doing it in the power of the Holy Spirit, they were proclaiming the word in the authority of the name of Jesus, and they were seeing these great results, and then we go clear back to what we see as a prophetic church at the end time, at the end of the church age, and that church is being committed for the same three things that apparently God never intended for it to change. Maybe he meant for us to stay the course. Trust the process. Preach the word and the power of the Holy Spirit and use the authority in the name of Jesus. But stuff has happened all through the years. And the church has been like the athlete who instead of staying the course has said, well, I'm not hit for any free throws. I can to try something different. I think I'll do it like a little champion again. Maybe I'll just shoot left hand. What am I going to do a hook shot in the free throw line? And, and, and because they seen some results that they didn't weren't particularly crazy about, all of a sudden the church said, let's try this, let's try that, let's try this, let's try that. No, God meant for us to stay in the course and trust the process the entire time, preach the word of God in the power of the Holy Spirit, and exercise the authority in the name of Jesus, and proclaim the gospel to a lost and dying world. He never meant for that to change. That's how he started, and that's who he's committed in the end, is those who stay faithful to that. simple. Stay the course. Trust the word. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 3 now. See how you got to leave this Revelation chapter 3. Verse number 8. I know thy works, behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for it he has a little strength, has kept my word, and has not denied my name. Kept my word. Now, most of the time we read that, most people would think, well, that means we obey the word. But that's not at all what that word kept is saying. It's very interesting. That word kept there means to protect. That word kept there means to watch over. That word kept there means to guard. So this church is being committed here because they still have a little power of the Holy Spirit. And they have kept the word. They stand strong in the end times. They stand strong in the last days and they protect the word of God. Now you might say, okay, pastor, how in the world am I going to protect the word? I mean, everything out there is attacking the word of God and has all throughout the history. How do I protect the word? You know, and the greatest example that I ever heard was by Charles Spurgeon. And he gave us very clear instructions on how to protect the Word. Let me use his illustration for a minute, and I'm just going to expand on his, his thought for a second. Imagine that in my backyard I have a pet lion. And I take him out there and about three times a day and tie him up so he can go to the bathroom and eat his food. Just kind of roam around the backyard. Yeah, I'm like, right, a little bit of stuff. And these, there's these 
three ne'er do wells down the road who like to harass my line. So they come by and they throw rocks at my line, mocking my line and taunting my line. And I'm thinking, there's going to how the heck, how can I stop them from messing with my line? Well, they kept sending me one day. I know. Hey guys, come here. Next time you throw a rock at my line, I'm going to untie it. <laughs> I just protected my line, haven't I? Because they only don't throw rocks at me one time. They don't throw rocks at me one time, they're going to chase them down and eat them. I just protected my line, haven't I? How did I protect my line? By just turning it loose. And that was Charles Spurgeon's comment. He said, you protect the word of God, the same way you protect the line, just turn it loose. How do you protect the word of God? You preach the word of God. How do you protect the word of God? You teach the word of God. How do you protect the word of God? You proclaim the word of God. Because God said his word will not return to him void, just like he told the prophet Jeremiah in a time of tremendous persecution was coming against him. He said, that's okay, Jeremiah. I'm going to make my word fire in your mouth and then wood. In other words, we don't compromise. We don't back off from the word of God. God said there's an open door over a church. And that's a church who stands in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's a church who stands strong on the Word of God. And they pre preach the Word of God. They teach the Word of God. They live the Word of God. They stand on the Word of God. And their whole life and whole being is a testimony to the faithfulness of God through His Word. He said, that is the church that's going to have an open door over them. Amen. This is starting to sound like a church I want to go to. I'm not from Philadelphia. They've just got a little strength, but they're standing on the Word. It's a church that has the power of the Holy Spirit. It's a church that's proclaiming the Word of God. And it's a church that doesn't deny His name. Do you realize when we go back, it, it, it just became fascinating to me. Because I began to look at the church of Philadelphia and look at the book of Acts and to compare the two. Because here we have the church being birthed and here we have the church in the last days that's standing strong and held as an example, and it's exactly what that early church was doing. Nothing has changed. So what is the point? God meant for us to stay the course. God meant for us to trust the process. God meant for us as believers to trust the process of the power of the Holy Spirit, to trust the process of God's Word, and trust the process of the name of Jesus. He never meant for it to change, and the same way it was birthed, it's going to go out in glory, beloved. The church of Philadelphia is being commended for the exact same thing that was birthed in the early church. They proclaimed the Word. But Acts chapter 3, we, we, we both encountered the man who was in gay beautiful pastor Tim alluded to it last night. Peter, John, Kevin, you know, so and go, have I done what I have, rise up and walk by? Right? In the name of Jesus. But what immediately happened? That was then attacked. The name of Jesus was immediately attacked. The powers of be immediately got them, took them into custody. And told them to never preach or teach in the name of Jesus again. And sent them out about their business. They went to their own company. They, they had a prayer meeting. God poured out the Spirit. The building shook. They went forth and proclaimed the word of God boldly. And we find right again in Acts chapter 5, they brought back into custody. Did we not tell you guys not to preach or teach in the name of Jesus? This time they wanted to really get the point across. And they beat them real good. And then sent them forth. You see, immediately that was attacked. You see, we see here the three elements that God stands strong on this church. The Word of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, <coughs> the name of Jesus. Yeah. And I would absolutely stand before you, proclaim to you throughout church history, those are the three things that the enemy has always fought against. The power and the workings of the Holy Spirit has always been challenged and fought against. The Word of God has always been fought against. The name of Jesus will just absolutely certify it anywhere. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? Something here we got to look at, beloved. And here's where I want to kind of talk to you for a minute about something. Three things. Power of the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, the name of 
through Jesus. Power of the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, the name of Jesus. Power of the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, the name of Jesus. We receive a lot. In the time we live, we see a lot of the moving of the Holy Spirit. We see a lot of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, don't we? We have access to the Word of God like a people who's never walked on this planet before. We have teaching and teaching and teaching and teaching and teaching more so than any other time in the history of the church on our authority in the name of Jesus. Doesn't that make sense? Doesn't that make sense? Listen, I'm going to just let this sit in for a moment because we're going to go somewhere and I'm going to ask you a big question. Power of the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, the name of Jesus. We have access to that. We experience that. We witness that. We have been taught how to do that. We've been taught, haven't we, how to walk in the Spirit. We've been taught about the Holy Spirit. We've been teaching, taught of the Word of God we have access like never before. We've been taught revelation of our authority in the name of Jesus like no people ever before. That's what I want us to understand. In the church history, we're the fat cats. But I want to challenge you tonight. Why is it stopping at that door? Why is the city still the same? And I'm going to challenge you with this. Is it possible? God asked me these questions, so trust me. You'd better hear from me than him. I see in the body of Christ right now to a great degree, a people who are consecrated to living, learning about the Holy Spirit, seeing the gifts of the Spirit, flowing in the Spirit. There's a lot of people who are consecrated to that. I see a lot of people who are consecrated to being taught the Word of God. I see a lot of people who are consecrated to learning, understanding, revelation about their authority in Jesus. That's where it stopped. I would challenge you tonight. Is it right that we can be consecrated to learning about the Holy Spirit and experiencing Him? We can be consecrated to learning the Word of God. We can be consecrated to learning about our authority, but not be consecrated to take what we have outside these doors. Pastor Tim's sermon last night is what you got. My sermon tonight is what you're doing. Because you're going to stand accountable for God for what you're doing with it. We have an open door. I want to challenge you tonight to consecrate your life to taking what you have outside those doors. Because you would much rather be challenged by me than Jesus. Would you rather have Pastor Mike stand in front of you challenge and say, you need to do this, and stand before Jesus said, why didn't you do that? You see, as I was preparing to teach tonight, I said, Lord, I understand what you're trying to share. But Lord, I don't understand how we could do this. And the Lord began to speak to me. And I want you to hear this tonight, and I want you to take this absolutely 100% serious as from God, from God, I believe it is. He said it's almost like a marriage covenant that he's looking for. In other words, he's looking for people who will consecrate themselves. So I said, Lord, it's like the open door covenant. They consecrate their lives to walking in the full power of the Holy Spirit. They consecrate themselves to walking in the Word. They 
consecrate themselves to walking in the name of Jesus. And above all, to consecrate themselves to take it to a lost and dying world. I think we got the first three down pretty good. I think we've stumbled on that before. Yes. Hallelujah. I heard David Wilkins say one time, he said, you know, he, he, he said, it breaks my heart, I can't just come up with a nice, happy sermon. So I was like, why do I got to be one to challenge everybody, Lord? <laughs> why can't I get up and a nice, happy sermon? Don't ask me to go down the guitar, here's what we're going to do. And yeah, we're not going to have an awful call with this, <clears throat> but we are. We had some altar calls just between us and Jesus.